In our fourth and final episode, we discover the last years of the pharaohs. From Persians to silver kings and the great conqueror. Numas has resurrected Osiris. And we delve deeper into the Greek ancestors of Alexander the Great, the Ptolemies. The real Cleopatra and how Egypt's religion was under attack by the Coptics after Cleopatra's fall to the Romans at the final outpost of this civilization. Egypt came to an end. What has happened here at the battle? Luxor Temple like you would have never seen it before. Join me to see Egypt's sunset years. Susanus was the third pharaoh of the 21st dynasty. His father was Peregem, who ruled from Thebes in the south. Yet Susanus ruled from the north in Lower Egypt, in Tanis, and Susanus was actually responsible for relocating an entire city known as Pyramis, built by his great ancestor Ramses II, and saved it from being flooded by the Nile. And I am about to meet the king that has fascinated my imagination, a pharaoh that few people know about. Pharaoh Susanes. His tomb was discovered in 1940 in the city of Tanis, almost 20 years after the discovery of Tutankhamun. This discovery was made by Pierre Monte and is one of the only tombs found completely intact. Unfortunately, this pharaoh's story was never told because of World War II. Susanes died at the age of 80 and ruled Egypt as pharaoh and high priest for 47 years. He is more commonly known as the Silver Pharaoh due to the silver sarcophagus of Horus and the silver sarcophagus in the form of himself. Susanis was a direct descendant of Meren Ptah, the son of Ramses the Great and Queen Nefertari. This is the Luxor Museum. It is one of the lesser known museums here in Egypt and I cannot wait to show everybody what is inside. We imagine a Mura as a man with two feathers. Yes. We have supposed to have feathers here. Two months ago. Yes. Why feathers? Some people look at this a mystery thing. No. The feather on the wings of the bird, they can high. Yes. So it is mean it is a hiding person, VIP person, yes. because he is a god of the gods. And two feathers, because everything in the life is two. Man and woman, black and white. I'm all good and Who also, yeah. the vulture, yes. and the two feathers. Two feathers yes. also, the god of everything. And also if you go to Iraq, if you go to Greece, you find Zeus there, the man very similar. It is the idea about the human, about the gods and the man. Amun means the hidden one. Yes. yes. The invisible, the one. invisible god. The invisible god who can walk between the people they can't rely on. Almost every pharaoh depicted themselves with Amun or depicted themselves as Amun with their wife as Mut. This is the bust of Hathor, which was found inside the tomb of Tutankhamun. And it's, it's wooden and it's been gold plated. And the eyes, you can see it's crystal 
and stone. It's very unique and very interesting to look into the eyes of Hathor. This is Tutankhamun, yes. You can tell immediately that it's Tutankhamun because of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the fine jaw. You can see it immediately. The Luxor Museum has many beautiful artifacts, not only from the reign of Tutankhamun. Many of the artifacts here are actually from the reign of Thutmose III. And one which I find particularly interesting are the shields which are remaining from Tutmosis's escapades into Nubia. The shields and the weapons yes. of the Nubians. Yeah. yeah, you can tell because of the giraffe that they have the pattern on the shield. Yes, yeah. they, they use the giraffe skin as a kind, like camouflage. <laughs> Over here, we have Amenhotep III with the crocodile god Sobek. And this, what's happening here is Sobek is holding the Ankh onto Amenhotep's chest, giving him life, showing him he supports him through life, uh, for good health maybe. And this statue is carved from one solid piece of yellow alabaster. It's so smooth, it's so shiny, it, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Actually, at the base is the name of Ramses II, which was not uncommon for pharaohs to add their names to certain statues. Sobek was revered throughout all the dynasties in Egypt. Sobek, apart from being a ferocious deity, was also in charge of protection and the fertility of the Nile waters. Ramses I, Seti and Ramses II were not the only pharaohs who changed names on statues. Horemheb, Pedagem and many of the Ptolemies had all changed names on statues, which leads me to speculate about who is depicted in this alabaster statue. This statue of solid alabaster is believed to be a statue of Seti I, but if you look at the face, it looks a little bit not quite how we see Seti. But, you know, a lot of the times the pharaohs did chip out the names and change the names like at Karnak. With Sedegem, he took out the name of Ramses II and put his on his own statue, leaving Nefertari's name on his leg. That is how you know who it was. But they believe that this is Seti I. Tutankhamun also wore a choker, so this I don't believe that this is Seti, I believe this is Tutankhamun. There is no cartouche here on the belt, it's been wiped off. However, this, like many things in Egypt, will remain a mystery forever. And Lavi, yes. this statue looks very Nubian, am I correct? Yes, that's right, and I was doubt strongly in this statue how come belong to Ramses the Sixth. And if we look to the inscription and cartouches, we see the name. it is look not uh, not in first condition. Mm -hmm. It means someone ca can be it out. Yes, moved it and out. if you look at the pharaoh's belt, yes, it's there's moved no name. Thank you for this notice. Mm -hmm. And his wing. And his it's crown. Nubian. It is look Nubian. Nubian so features completely. Pharaohs did take out names, replace it with their own. In the 26th dynasty, after several invasions by the Libyans, Assyrians, and Persians, such as King Shoshank, Egypt was split into separate ruling states yet again. A local ruler called Samtik came onto the throne and ruled mainly in Upper Egypt near Aswan, where he built a nilometer to measure the floods near Aswan and recorded his story at Elephantine Island. This period in time was very turbulent as there was no clear ruler and Egypt was yet again ununified. Zamtik led small but successful campaigns into Kush, Nubia, Syria and Palestine. But the pharaohs of the 26th dynasty were under constant threat from Babylon and the Persians. One Persian, Cambyses, 
invaded Egypt and took it by force, killing Samtik III in Memphis. This is the Nubian village, which is so traditional, you can actually still see how people many, many years ago used to live here. It's actually quite interesting to come and have a look at. And apart from that, we have this beautiful view. So let's go have lunch. In my opinion, Aswan is the most beautiful city in Egypt. I can't describe to you what it feels like to be in this amazing place. The sun setting, the gold on the sand, the color of the water. It's just everything. You feel transported back like 3,000 years ago. It was not until the 31st dynasty in 332 BC that Egypt would become unified again. And not because of an Egyptian, because of a Greek. Alexander the Great wanted what the Persians had. 40,000 Macedonian Greeks stormed into Egypt and Alexander took Egypt over from the Persians. He wanted to become a true Egyptian pharaoh by worshiping the god Amun once again. He restored many monuments, staying only about six months in Egypt. He even founded a new capital city, Alexandria. Egypt was now ruled by a new Greek family who still followed the Egyptian religion and the Egyptian traditions and this family was known as the Ptolemies. While we had some time free, my friend and Bollywood star Monica Joshi and I decided to do a little photo shoot together.
now going to have a nighttime visit to the temple of Komombo for Sobek the crocodile and Taurus the falcon. Let's go in. This is Horus, the falcon-headed god, and this is Sobek, the crocodile-headed god, the god of the water of the Nile, and also the god of protecting and helping with fertility, also for helping to heal the skin, and Horus was helping to heal the eyes. This temple was actually designed almost as a hospital for healing those ailments. Komombo is very unique and the art style is very different from any other temple. This is a Ptolemaic temple built by the Greeks. As this is a temple dedicated to healing, they have a depiction of the god Imhotep, the inventor of medicine, where we see an amazing image showing all of his medical instruments that he invented. Here we see Horus, he's huge, Cleopatra, not Cleopatra the seventh that we know, Cleopatra the sixth, and her father Ptolemy the sixth, who built this temple. It's very apparent that this is a Greek Ptolemaic temple, just by the style of the art, but it is still so Egyptian and still so beautiful. Just because the Greeks had adopted Egyptian customs and religion doesn't mean that it was going to last. Back on the cruise ship, it was time for some more modern yet traditional entertainment. Edfu Temple is a Ptolemaic temple here in Egypt. It is built by the Greeks, originally started by Ptolemy VI and added on from there by every pharaoh. And the final pharaoh who added on here was Queen Cleopatra VII. And inside you will see a very nice cartouche of Cleopatra. What you're looking at here is a statue, a stone statue of Horus that was erected here by Cleopatra for her husband Caesar and underneath Horus is Cleopatra's son. And what this represents is actually showing that Caesar is Horus and Horus as we know was meant to be for the pharaohs. The pharaoh is Horus on earth. So this 
is very symbolic showing that Caesar was actually in charge of Egypt at this time. Although built during Ptolemaic times, a small section inside the temple suggests that it may have been built in the New Kingdom during the reign of Horemheb or Ramses I. This is an even better statue of Caesar in the form of Horus. As you can see, it's very well preserved. He's got the white and the red crown, north and south. How the falcon is actually a little bit grinning to show what has happened here, the battle between Set and Horus. Like many temples, the ceiling here has been covered up by black smoke during the Christian Coptic times. This pillared hall measures 36 meters high and was actually buried halfway under sand until the 1860s. On this wall we can see the Pharaoh Ptolemy laying down the first brick of the temple with the goddess Seshat, the goddess of writing, helping him to lay out the temple. This is the boat with the priests and the pharaoh and Horus inside his shrine, guarded by Isis and Nephthys. Horus is inside and they are carrying him all the way to Dendera. The main reason for carrying Horus on the boat to Dendera was to join him with his consort, Hathor. The inner sanctuary is the oldest part of the temple and inside here is where they house the golden statue of Horus as well as the boat which would have carried him and concealed him during his travels. Carry some perfumes as the offering to the god Horus of this temple. And each one of them, she has, she's a woman. She's a city and each one of them carry the name of the city. Yes. It means okay. this woman are all the cities of Egypt and villages they come to get the offering to the gods. Inside Edfu, there is a depiction here, as they believe this is the spot where this happened, a depiction of Horus and Set, where Horus defeated Set because Set killed his father, Osiris. And in this depiction, Set transforms himself into a hippo, and Horus transforms himself into a man, and destroys Set the hippo with his harpoon on his boat. And this is, they believe, the place where this happened, where Horus avenged his father's death. This is the battle. Here, very small, we see the hippo of Set, and he's defeating Set, defeating chaos in Egypt. The scale of Set is very important to show that Horus has now defeated him. Also, here we have a list of all the pharaohs of Egypt and here it ends with Cleopatra VII. Obviously we all know her story where she killed herself with the snake biting her breast. And at the top here are all the empty cartouches where they were expecting for more pharaohs to be coming. But obviously, after Cleopatra's defeat, they never completed it because she was the last pharaoh of Egypt. But I have a feeling one of those is waiting for my cartouche. During the battle, Set stabbed out Horus's eye, and him and his mother Isis set out to consult with Hathor to magically reanimate his eye, and his eye would become a very spiritual symbol for the ancient Egyptians.
I want to show you around a little tour of my Nile cruise that I'm on. It's really amazing, so come with me. Nice reception. Very friendly. Thank you very much. And if you come through here, this is the bar slash party area. And this is the dining room. Hi, hello. How are you? Very good. Welcome. How are you? Hi, thank Hi, you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Have a nice meal. Thank you, we will. I'm sure we will. The kitchens are so well organized and they make all of the food here fresh. And very friendly staff. This is the gorgeous Sunday cup here. Come have a drink, have a little swim in the pool, and because of the sun, you can get a tan in less than two minutes here. And if you come this way, a little souvenir shop, very dangerous for me. And this is my room. Come inside. Nile cruising is actually very historical, as in the early 1800s, the only way for tourists to travel was by boat. It wasn't until 1897 that Thomas Cook opened up his first commercial Nile cruise line. We're now in Isna and we're waiting to go through the lock. We're going to lower the water. And what's really interesting is down here we've got everybody trying to sell you things. They're just trying to sell you things everywhere here. All the, it's like a market on water. And they're just throwing things up and people are throwing the money down. And it's really interesting. Dindira Temple was built in the Middle Kingdom but extended by the Ptolemies by the Greeks. This beautiful temple dedicated to Hathor was built by Cleopatra, but after Cleopatra's fall and Egypt's fall to the Romans, Egypt would never be the same again and it faced complete devastation. You can also see here from all the Coptics came here and they chipped out all the faces here. Yes. And they actually took down some of the stones from the temple here and built their own church. That's right. And we will see the church uh, next to this mountain. Over here, you can see he's wearing the ram's horns of Amun, yeah. which was started by Alexander the Great to wear the horns. Mm -hmm. And every Ptolemy depicted themselves with the ram's horns because they wanted they wanted to be like Alexander the Great by putting the same horns on their heads. Yeah. Even though Dindira Temple is very beautiful, you cannot forget about the persecution these people went through. This is the Coptic church yeah. with the, the cross, and these are built out of the stone that Dindira Temple was originally built out of. That temple over there is still standing very strong, and this one is not standing very well. They yeah. couldn't build as well as the Egyptians could build. Of course, of course. We can do similar things to Egyptians. Stories of Cleopatra are mainly on the outside walls of this temple. If you look over here, these are all of the crowns of what the pharaohs would wear. We have the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt and the double crown. Robin, double crown. As we go up, we have the Nubian crown, the Nemes headdress, the blue Kepesh crown. Yeah. We have the crown of Amun. 
it just goes on as the Pharaoh becomes more divine, right? Yes. A tomb also. Yes. Some of uh, Bartholomew crowned. At the back of the temple, we see Cleopatra's dedication to Caesar. Cleopatra and Caesar, and their son Caesarian. Yes. And a lot of people don't know that the way of birth, when they, you have a C-section, a Caesarian, yeah. it was actually invented yeah. by the Egyptians. Yeah. When Cleopatra gave birth to her son, they had to cut her open because she was having complications. Yes. And it comes from Cleopatra. Comes, yes. From Caesar from and Caesar. Cleopatra. And until now they named this surgery Caesar. Exactly. Dendera Temple was a vast complex with many houses for priests and noblemen and was dedicated to the worship of Hathor, the goddess of music, dance, beauty and love. This is very sad because Hathor is the goddess of beauty and here they've taken away her beauty, they've taken away her face. This is the sacred lake that the priests, that the priests would use to cleanse themselves before entering the temple. Purity for the ancient Egyptians meant that you were clean and presentable. You were not allowed to enter into a temple as a priest or even as the queen or the king if you were not clean and presentable for the gods. This lapis blue pillared hallway was one of the most decorated in all of history. Here we see the sky goddess Nut as she swallows the sun and it passes through her body until yeah. she gives birth to the sun on the temple of yeah. Hathor. Cleopatra's wealth and intelligence is reflected in the color and the details of the religious texts on her ceiling of her temple. Above here we can see one of the first ever depictions of the zodiac. We have starting with Leo and you can see Scorpio, Sagittarius, Taurus, Pisces, Cancer, all listed in this ancient Egyptian temple. The ancient Egyptians were the first people to use the stars and astrology, as well as many other practices, and they are not credited enough with the amount of things that they discovered and invented. Above, we see the story of the Eye of Horus that Hathor revived for Horus after Set stabbed it out. And you can see all the other gods coming to worship this all-seeing magical eye. Definitely bring a neck brace when you go to Dendera as you cannot stop yourself from looking at the details on this ceiling. Used as a church after Cleopatra by the Christians, the inscriptions on the ceiling were too high and they used black smoke to cover them up. Even after being defaced, the Egyptian spirits are still here. A recurring scene that you will see at Dindira is the story of Isis and Osiris and here in this chapel we see Isis and her sister Nephthys resurrecting Osiris after he was murdered by Set. Come with me as we go underneath Dindira temple into these very narrow tunnels that the priests would have used for ritualistic purposes 
but also during the Coptic times, the priests came down here to hide from the Christians who were coming in to try and convert them, and if they did not convert, well, we know what their fate would have been. This is also where you see a very controversial image known as the Dindira light bulb. Good. Oh, you did that. I did it. Oh, sugar. Sugar. So it's melted. But because if it is again naturally granite, impossible to be such this way at all. Of course, there's some substance about that. So one of the mysteries, how it looked like melted. If, if, if uh, from the friction of the heat, it will go down, not dry up like this, this one. This melted. Look, yeah. melted. One of the mysteries. One set of stairs is spiraling, the other completely straight, symbolizing Horace's flight during an attack. You see these priests here, they're carrying what look like flags, but actually it's a symbol for a different city. In the uppermost part of Dindira, we see Geb, the god of the earth, with his wife, the goddess Nut of the sky. Here, they are guarding this very special room which shows the resurrection of Osiris and the birth of his son, Horus. While, yes, while Isa, uh, Osiris are sleeping, after Nephthys and Isis made the bread to, uh, to, to make him turn back to the life, and here, while he just standing and put his hand right here, waking yes. up, waking up. And we move on here where we see Isis yes. here. She come like She is making baby. Horus. Yes, and she came in the uh, image of the bird mm -hmm. to open him, yes. to have pregnancy process with him. Yes. And here we see the god Anubis, Anubis yeah. resurrecting Osiris. Anubis and has yeah. resurrected Osiris and Why? he's waking up now. Raising uh, his name. Up. Coming, coming back to life. Coming back to life. And now he's been mummified again to become the god of the underworld. Who is this woman? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to guess. Okay, no, wait, that's too long. This is Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor in the movie Cleopatra. Now, I want to show you some depictions of Cleopatra. Elizabeth Taylor, surely she is amazingly beautiful. Look at the lips, the nose, everything. She's perfect. However, the Cleopatra that I know and that I've seen in her depictions is not Elizabeth Taylor. This is a coin, Cleopatra. She's not the beauty that we all know. She was an intelligent woman. I'll give her that. She was intelligent. She was strong. She fought for her country. When she saw she couldn't hold on to her country, things didn't work so well. But this is a coin showing Cleopatra, big nose, big chin. Yeah, a marble bust of Cleopatra. She surely does not look much like Elizabeth Taylor. Cleopatra is very celebrated in history. But the image from movies, as we know movies exaggerate things, the image of Cleopatra is nowhere near what the movie portrayed. They did this, Cecil B. DeMille did this with Ramses II with the Ten Commandments. It's just how things work these days, but you have to look at the facts. But Cleopatra, you know what? She didn't do too much of a bad job, and she tried to hold on to Egypt for as long as she could. She used her body for the good of the country, to secure Caesar. She secured Caesar by using her body. If she had Caesar as a husband, he couldn't have make a war against his wife's country. Very clever. And she spoke something like 11 languages. So, next time you think of Cleopatra, don't think about 
Elizabeth Taylor, think about the real Cleopatra, the strong queen behind the actual story. Even though the Ptolemies lived in the city founded by their great ancestor, Alexandria, the religious roles were still carried out in Thebes, modern-day Luxor, and this was the wish of the Ptolemies to continue the Egyptian traditions and the Egyptian religion, sometimes even combining certain gods with their own. Wow, look at that view. Yeah, amazing. You can see the Karnak from behind. All the obelisks that's the pillars, everything. Everything. It's beautiful. Being bathed in the sun's golden rays, you are transported back thousands of years in time. Every morning before sunrise, the priests of Amun would come here to this sacred lake and purify themselves in the way of bathing, exactly like we do every morning. They would go in, bath, swim over to the other side, walk up. On that side, they would get dressed. They would do their eyeliner, their makeup. Then they would prepare the food over there, walk it over and deliver the food to the, the golden statue of Amun. And this lake is very sacred to the ancient Egyptian people and the water was delivered here by a canal straight from the Nile and this is indeed a very sacred thing to look at when you it's very powerful when you see the sun coming through hitting the temples and glistening here on the water Philae Temple is between the old dam wall and the new high dam wall so the only way to get to this little island is by taking a boat and it's a very secluded place, a very special place. last hideaway in ancient times for the Egyptians, and it is heartbreaking if you know its history. Here at Philae Temple, you can see the absolute devastation caused by the Christians when they came here. They forced the Egyptians to this island if they would not convert to Christianity, and eventually they took them by force. And along here you can see where the Christians came and they chiseled out all the faces. And on this wall here, there's absolutely nothing left. Not one hieroglyphic, nothing. They just took away the history. It's very sad. For the Egyptians, the ultimate sacrilege was taking away someone's name and someone's face. So they knew exactly what they were doing. There are many temples here, including the main one, which is dedicated to the goddess Isis. But this one here is dedicated to Hathor, which you can tell by looking at the beautiful face of the cow-eared goddess Hathor. After Cleopatra's death and the Romans came in, it was a very turbulent time for the ancient Egyptians who were still trying to hold on to their own belief system. You can still see here where the Christians came and they chiseled out Cleopatra along with all the other Egyptian gods as well as the other Ptolemaic pharaohs who were depicted here.
there is not one face of a queen, a king, or a god that was left untouched. But Philae was not only damaged by human hands, but also by the hand of Mother Nature. Subsequent flooding from the Nile was to prove just as devastating. More places here where you can see where they've chiseled out Osiris's body and his face and Isis. At two different colors. The upper part of the walls are darker and the lower part are lighter. That's why this temple was built on Philae temple. Centuries passed and collapsing of ancient uh, Egyptian civilization and modern history come in, 90, in 1902 uh, the British built the British Dam or Aswan Dam. So yes, before the High Dam. So the, during the Nile flood season, the water come to the half of the temple. After you can see, you can see the difference. Yes. Washed out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after that, the High Dam built. So the location of the temple was between the Aswan Dam and the High Dam and submerged completely. Here some trying of restoration, and you can see this restoration inside the uh, divine birth room inside the temple. This is an area that people are not... Oh, look at the little bats. Yes. Oh, oh, ah, 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 
the impact of ancient Egypt and this great civilization has left an impact on the world which is unlike any other. This is from the view at Abul Haggag, uh, the mosque here, inside the, the Luxor temple complex. And if you are allowed to come up here and have a view, you can see a really great perspective of the temple and you can actually see a nice close-up of the statues of Ramses. You're actually looking at the great king in his eyes. Ramses II, like every other pharaoh, has left a legacy for the world, and they will be standing here for thousands of years, once we are all gone. This is Luxor Temple like you would have never seen it before from a totally different angle. Inside Abul Haggag Mosque, there are actually pillars and parts of Luxor Temple that they've used to construct the mosque many, many years ago. It's very special to be allowed to come in here. Come look at this. These are the cartouches for Ramses II. Inside this Muslim mosque, it's actually very special to see this. Wow. And we're standing here, the statue of Ramses and his temple inside. These are pillars and stone from an Egyptian temple and inside is an Islamic tomb and it's very special because it's the two civilizations, the two religions living together as one in peace. And there we see Ramses and Nefertari. A different sight is seeing Luxor Temple at night and at night actually you can really feel the grandeur of the scale that this place was built on and you really should try and come here at night to feel the splendor and the magic of these columns at night all everything illuminated. <laughs> 